Grid Arndal, which is one of the implementing partners of the Blue Solutions Project. You see our logo there in the middle of the screen, pretty much in blue. Um, I work with the Blue Solutions Initiative, and uh, this webinar is part of a longer series of um, webinars that we give on the topics of the Panorama and platform and partnership. And I'm just going to tell us uh, in two minutes or three um, what this all is about. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, we apologize for the glitch in the timing. It was a misunderstanding between, like we said in an email, between people and, and, and the system. Uh, but here we are. Um, so um, we'll go right into it. So as you can see here, we have two, two, two initiatives who are hosting this. And uh, so it's... Um, it's a panorama webinar hosted by Blue Solutions is how we call it. And the Blue Solutions Initiative um, really is a global um, partnership to, to do, do things. Um, one, to share knowledge, share experiences, share things that have happened, share what we call Blue Solutions. And on the other hand is to develop capacity. Um, you can see our, our um, URL address there. I'm just going to show the website for those who are interested. Here it is. This is the Blue Solutions website. It's got all the background on the project, videos on it, and importantly, here is a button to subscribe to our newsletter. So this is us. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we mean by Blue Solutions, because two of the presenters that we have here today are going to present their um, Blue Solution. So the idea is that um, in the realm of the management of coastal um, or marine environments, we have a lot of success stories, a lot of things, approaches, projects that have proven really useful, really successful, and that other people around the globe can learn from. So the idea of Blue Solutions is that we work with the people who we called solution providers in the first place. That's the little person there with an exclamation point. And, uh, and, and understand their solutions and describe their solutions in a way that makes it understandable and replicable for the other person, the solution seeker. And we do that by breaking these solutions up into what we call building blocks. And you'll hear more about building blocks uh, when Esther and Samir um, present. But the assumption is that um, when we break these up, not every building block is going to be useful for the solution seeker. Maybe it's just one. Um, but then there's a critical lesson in there that can be learned by that solution seeker, and maybe the seeker finds another building block for his or her problem uh, in other solutions. So right now we have about 120 plus solutions uh, on the new solutions part of the Panorama platform. So that's what we do. Um, here's just some key um, yeah, criteria for Blue Solutions, and, and those that are underlined are the most important ones. So it must have had a proven impact. It can't just be an idea, uh, something that, you know, has proven that it has worked. And it must be replicable or upscalable, so it can't be dependent on very um, specific circumstances, local champion, big pot of money, these kind of things. So that's what Blue Solutions are. Um, so Blue Solutions hosts the marine and coastal portal of the Panorama platform. So the Panorama partnership does what Blue Solutions does. It identifies documents, promotes examples that are inspiring, replicable, so forth. But Panorama is broader. It doesn't look only at marine and coastal issues. It looks at ecosystem-based adaptation as well as protected area solution. So currently, we have three of these thematic portals, but we envision it to be uh, growing continuously in terms of partners as well as themes so we can um, provide for us sort of cross-sectoral learning. Again, at the bottom you see the, the URL, and I was going to show you the website real quick. Um, here it is. So here you have the three portals, and you have some background on it, and here you can start browsing the, the solutions. You can search for things and so forth. So this is Panorama. Um, for this webinar, um, we have 75 minutes, which is a bit of an odd time, but we wanted to give uh, enough time for questions and answers. 
and discussions at the end of it. So right now we're in the middle of me providing an introduction here. And next we'll have Nicolas Beaumont, who's a senior researcher um, at Plymouth Marine Laboratories um, for 10 minutes, giving us a bit of a keynote presentation on lessons learned on successful use of marine ecosystem services information. Bef before we go into two blue solutions, one from Bonaire um, by Esther Wolfs, who leads Wolfs Company in, in, in the Netherlands, and previously in Bonaire for 10 minutes. And uh, Samia Rosado, who works with the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute. So that's a general outline of this webinar. I'll hand over to Nicola. I'm just going to show you if you want to know more about her. You find her here on Plymouth Marine Laboratory, her impressive resume, the key projects that she's working on, key publications that she's done, and so forth. Over to you, Nicola. Okay, Nicola, and you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, can you see that? Yep, it looks great. Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, firstly, uh, hello, and um, thank you to everybody for joining and spending your time with us today. Um, I am Nicola Beaumont. I work at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and I've worked in the field of ecosystem services for the last 20 years. And what I wanted to do today was very quickly share with you some of the key lessons which I've learned over this time. Um, I Nicola, think one of the first things that's really important when... Yeah? Uh, it advanced. Never mind. I was going to give you a suggestion if it didn't advance, but go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the a key a key point to make is uh, when we start talking about ecosystem services, it's often worth just taking a minute to say what we understand an ecosystem service to be. Now, the term ecosystem service was actually coined in the 1970s, so it's been around for a long time. It really came into common usage, however, just in 2003 with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Now. Since then, it's been redefined and reclassified many, many times, and this has led to some confusion, really. However, the essence of it has remained the same throughout, and I really like the definition shown on this slide, which is um, an ecosystem service is an aspect of the ecosystem which we utilize to produce human well-being. So really, all an ecosystem service is is a benefit which we receive from the environment which enhances or improves our well-being. And I think maintaining that simplicity in how we think about ecosystem services is really important. So an ecosystem service may be anything from food, such as fish, through to using the environment for recreation, through to the fact that the environment takes up waste, such as our carbon dioxide, and it provides us with flood defense capacity. So I see the ecosystem service um, approach really as, as something that should be very simple. And in fact, it is this simplicity that first attracted me to this 20 years ago. Because I thought, well, this is fantastic. This is a fantastic way to communicate to people why the environment is important. It's not just important in its own right. It's important in maintaining our societal well-being and in maintaining our economy. And I thought this is going to be a great way to communicate to academics, to politicians and policymakers and managers, to the general public, and to industry and commerce. And I saw it as a great way to translate why the environment is so important to our well-being. Now, I was very excited when I was 20 years old, and uh, I saw a great future for the ecosystem service approach. However, in the last 20 years, I've seen a lot of success, but I've also seen a number of failures. And I want to start with the failures and talk a little bit about why we haven't seen the ecosystem service approach used as well as we might have expected. I think one of the first reasons why it hasn't always been successfully used is this complexity in the terminology. Academics are terrible at defining and redefining and classifying and reclassifying things. And I think in some cases, this has alienated people from the concept. 
A second reason is I think also it has become almost too academic in some cases. Again, alienating the stakeholders that it's intended to inform. Not um, engaging people in the concept when we're trying to use this is, has been a real failure. And in some cases, I've seen assessments undertaken that simply aren't relevant to the stakeholders who wanted to use them. A third failure has been that sometimes an assessment has been undertaken and the results have been taken then to the stakeholder or user, but they felt uncertain or insecure about using the results because they don't really understand them or they think that they're too uncertain and they don't understand the error bars associated with some of the outcomes and this really puts people off from using the results. And one of the final reasons that I've seen for failure is the fact that people have this perception that an ecosystem service assessment will be very costly, it will require a lot of resources and a huge team of academics. And I think um, these really are some of the key reasons why we haven't seen ecosystem service assessments be used as successfully as I originally hoped. Now, the most important thing when we have failure is that we move on and we learn and we look to the future and think, okay, well, if this has been a failure in the past, what can we learn to make sure that we have success in the future? So I've got six key lessons for success um, based on my experience. I mean, I, I could probably have had 20, but I picked the six really key ones that, that come out in my mind. The first lesson that I would really encourage anybody who is going to do an assessment to do is to really invest a lot of resource in planning the ecosystem service assessment at the beginning and not planning it just in a room with a bunch of academics but to get out there and plan with the users who are going to use the assessment. I think that in um, the Balmer project, uh, which is one of the many projects that I've worked on, what we did here is we came up with a process called the triage and this was really nice because it made this initial planning step quite systematic so we had a series of steps that we went through with our stakeholders so the first thing was to get the stakeholders together stage one here on the diagram and talk to them about why did they want an ecosystem service assessment and this may sound ridiculous but it's so important to have this conversation about actually what, what are they hoping to get out and, and what is the reason that they think they would like an ecosystem service assessment in their area. The second step is then to really talk to them about which ecosystem services they'd like to look at and in which of their areas and habitats would they like to focus. And the third step is to talk to them about which methods they'd like and what they would like their outputs to look like. This has been a very interesting step because I find that people are very different in what they want at the end. Some people really love monetary evaluation and I tend to find this when we're working at a high national level, there's a lot of enthusiasm for monetary values. But when you come down to a local level, people are often more wary of monetary values and much more interested in qualitative um, information, in, in mapping of information. And having these types of conversations in this very strategic way with your stakeholders is before you begin the assessment makes a huge difference to whether or not your assessment is going to be successful or not. So that was really my first lesson for success is really engage your stakeholders from the beginning in a very careful way. The additional benefit to this is then your stakeholders feel they have ownership and they feel like they belong within the project and a much more loud how important it is. Um, oh, I'm getting an error message. Hear me okay? We lost you for a few seconds there, Nicola. Uh, if you could maybe go back to the last part of that other slide, we, we can hear you again. Okay. Okay, so I was, did you hear the part where I said about the methods and how monetary valuation was very important? In some, yeah? Okay, 
I think, um, in that case, because of time, I'll move on to lesson two. Um, the second lesson um, is the importance of applying a dynamic um, and connected approaches, including not just one ecosystem service, but many ecosystem services. And I have an example here again from the Valmer project. I think it's, it's been tempting in the past to provide policymakers with just one static assessment of their ecosystem services. So you tell them right at this moment you have this much ecosystem service in this area. Now that is helpful to a point, but it doesn't help people make decisions. It doesn't help people decide how to manage an area. It's only by discussing with them how their ecosystem services may change over time that they can really start to understand how they can manage their area differently. Also discussing with them how the ecosystem service delivery is connected between different areas and habitats. So what happens on land affects what happens at sea. What happens at one area of the coast affects the neighboring areas of the coast. Discussing that connectivity is also really important. And it's incredibly important is not just looking at one ecosystem service, but looking at a broad set of ecosystem services. So the maps we produced here that you can see on the slide, um, we did these for the Valmer project, and the shaded gray area is the land, and the pink matrix area is the sea. And we mapped out how ecosystem service delivery would change it over time. So the slide on the left is what is happening at the moment. The slide on the right is what's happening potentially in the future under a different scenario. And by showing <clears throat> these maps and these changes over time and showing the spatial variation, this really enabled the stakeholders to make um, management decisions, make much better informed management decisions. My third lesson was it's really important to undertake local scale assessments. One of my first experiences was on the national ecosystem uh, assessment here in the UK. And I took my national level results down to some of my local stakeholders that I know. And I very proudly showed my results to the local people. And they said, well, that's great, but that doesn't help us make a decision here. Because our issues here at this local level are very different. And you cannot extrapolate that national level information meaningfully down to this local level. So I think this really actually getting down, if you want to make a difference at a local level, you have to get down and work at that local level. You can't simply extrapolate across. My fourth lesson is the importance of interdisciplinary research. And here, on um, the left hand side we've got a selection, um, we've got economists and a natural scientists and geographers but also now I think it's important increasingly in the projects I work in we're bringing in psychologists and governance experts and even artists and bringing together this group of interdisciplinary researchers makes a huge difference to the success of any project. What I would say here is a word of caution and always, when you're pulling together a research team, is to make sure that the people that you're pulling together actually want to work in an interdisciplinary fashion. And this is the picture on the right-hand side. It's really important when you get this group of people together that they do want to interact and want to undertake this interdisciplinary work together. Um, but if you're going to do a good ecosystem service assessment, you do need this interdisciplinary expertise. Lesson five is how important it is to be honest about your data gaps and uncertainty. And I think this was one of the reasons I said for the failure in the opening, one of the opening slides, is that stakeholders are put off if there is too much uncertainty. However, if you take your time, um, and the slide here is one of the slide we one of the slides that I've used previously to communicate the uncertainty and be honest with them and explain what this uncertainty actually means. It need not be a barrier to using ecosystem service approaches, but really working on communicating it across using methods such as mapping to demonstrate the uncertainty um, can overcome the issue of people not wanting to use it because of the uncertainty. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment about how to handle data gaps and uncertainty. But if you really tackle it head on, <clears throat> it need not be a barrier. My final lesson for today is 
the importance of recording what you have done and in particular recording your failures as well as your successes. I th think that this generally doesn't happen at the moment. We all as academics, quite often what we will do is we will go and we will do a project, we'll write up our publication and we'll move on to the next project. And we do not properly record exactly what we have done. This means that as a community of ecosystem service practitioners, we aren't learning as effectively as we would if we were recording our assessments more, more effectively. The other thing is to record the impact. So it's quite common, I hear people say, oh, uh, my research had this impact, but with no real evidence as to why. So if you've done an ecosystem service assessment and it has been successful and it has altered the way in which an area is managed, it's key to record that impact so you can understand why it had an impact. Or equally, like I said, if your research hasn't worked and it hasn't had an impact, record that as well so we know what does work and what doesn't work. So there are my six very quick lessons um, from 20 years in the field. I hope they're helpful. Uh, any questions, please feel free to contact me and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, thank you very much, Nicola. This was really, really, very interesting and really, very um, yeah, <clears throat> useful. I think for anybody who's interested in, in ecosystem services, because this is a question that's coming up all the time. Um, we're investing a lot of resources into an assessment or, or even an economic valuation, and, and then the question comes: how can how can we make this an impact? Uh, before we move on to Esther. Um, Sarah was just going to explain uh, how to use the questions panel. Uh, yes. Before. yes, thank you everyone. Um, and we feel free to send in questions during the presentations. Um, uh, you'll also have the oppor opportunity after the presentations. But um, within your user interface of the GoToWebinar system, there's a qu uh, qu questions panel. You can type the questions in and then during the question and answer period, those questions will be relayed to the presenters. Um, and it, it would be helpful if, you'd, uh, if, it, if your question is specifically for one of the speakers to let us know which one. Um, but if it's j just a general question, that's fine too. Um, so again, please go ahead and send in questions while they're sending, while they're presenting, that's fine. And you'll also have the opportunity after. Okay, thanks Christian. Uh, so now I'd like to hand over to Esther Wolf. Um, Sarah, could you just make me a presenter for a split second? Yep, so this is, whoo, this is, I just want to show her, uh, this is Esther Wolf. She's running her own company <laughs> called Nature by Numbers. Uh, like I said before, Esther was uh, uh, based in Bonaire, that's in the Caribbean, and this is also the blue solution that she's going to talk about. Um, but I think Esther, you relocated to the Netherlands. Um, for anybody who's interested, um, this is the URL. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, we, we are still um, uh, having an office on Bonaire and as well as in the Netherlands. Um, and thank you for uh, the opportunity and thanks Blue Solution for the opportunity to present the case uh, of Bonaire. On Bonaire, we did a total economic valuation of the ecosystem services. And I want to present to you some of um, the results of this study and the impact of the results. Um, first, I want to go into valuing ecosystem services. Um, the concept is, is rather basic and I probably uh, a lot of you already uh, understand the concept, but I'm going to show it very briefly. If you have an ecosystem, and as Nicola already presented, you can have services such as it's beautiful that tourists want to dive over there, it's healthy so it produces fish, it's relaxing so on the weekend you want to spend time on the beach. And there is a way, a method to economically value these services. And we use the TEEP framework which stands for the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. And what we have been doing is we have been valuing the ecosystem services of Bonaire and of Saban Station as well. Those three islands form the Caribbean Netherlands. Um, and what we do uh, by 
uh, is as, as Wolf's company, is we try to support the development of sustainable economies um, by targeting communities, the private sector, governments, and nature management. And basically a bit of the same groups um, as Nicola presented, only we target a bit more towards nature management instead of the scientific community. And we do that by showing and demonstrating what the economic value is of nature, of natural capital. By valuing ecosystem services, you can also take that economic value into decision making, into cost benefit analysis. Um, you can look at sustainable financing mechanisms. You can demonstrate to businesses how they depend on and how they impact those services and what that economically means. And by communicating about these tools. And, and as been um, presented before, valuing ecosystem services is just one of the approaches. Um, and it is um, just a tool to achieve, for example, awareness. Um, and um, now I'm going to go more into detail into the uh, project of Bonaire. And what we, for example, did is to raise awareness on the economic importance of the natural capital of Bonaire. I also now demonstrate Anguilla and BVI. But what I want to show you is that by valuing ecosystem services, you can look at the value of nature to, in this case, tourism industry. So if we look at the above line, it's total expenditures, that is the amount of money that tourists spend when visiting those islands like Anguilla, BVI and Bonaire. The added value is the amount of money that stays on the island. Um, because there is a lot of money flowing away and also, for example, if you um, sell uh, dive courses, then the money spent on equipment is money that doesn't stay on the island very often because it's imported products. And then the final line is related to ecosystem. So the amount of money that stays on the island that is directly related to the services of the ecosystems. For example, diving is one-to-one -one related to an ecosystem service, namely a beautiful coral reef. However, staying in a hotel, renting a car isn't directly related. Um, so, and as you can see, for example, in the case of Bonaire, 74% of the money staying on the island is directly related to nature. And that demonstrates to a tourism industry how extremely important nature, and in this case the coral reefs, are for the economy of the island. Another important uh, aspect that we demonstrated during the study, as you can see here in the table, is we asked the tourists if they were willing to return to Bonaire. And so the first one uh, is the current situation. Do people want to come back to Bonaire? And about 60% of the people say, yes, I would like to come back. However, if the island gets more crowded, or in the case that the marine environment gets really degraded, you see that the number of people that do come back to Bonaire is substantially lower. This insight, because of the study, made the biggest tourism association in Bonaire, which is the Bonaire Hotel and Tourism Association, to sit down with the nature conservation organizations monthly to discuss the status of nature. So what you see is that in this case, what makes the Bonaire tourism industry tick is the tourism numbers and the fact that they are coming back. Showing how important nature is to this relation um, makes uh, a huge awareness among um, the uh, private sector. Another impact that we had on this tourism study as well was that we demonstrated how ecology is connected to economy so in this case, you see two graphs where we have an ecological scenario and that demonstrates what the impact is of not implementing a sewage system. And the dark blue in this graph is coral reefs. And what you see is that coral reefs are degrading and algae is taking over if we do not do something about the nutrient floats into the water, into the marine system. And then the graph next to it, it says economic impact scenario that demonstrates the economic impact of the ecological scenario. So what you see is in 15 years time, if the coral reef is really degrading, you also see that the economic value is seriously going down from 120 
total economic value in dollars, 120 million dollars, to approximately like 50 million dollars. Um, and this made the State Secretary of the ne Netherlands, is a very high uh, government official, constantly refer to the Bonaire case, demonstrating how economy and ecology are interlinked. If we look at decision support, I'm going to give you an example of a cost-benefit analysis, including externalities. So, a traditional cost-benefit in scenario, uh, in this case for livestock management, the management of free-roaming goats, in, in a traditional way you look at costs, such as fencing and hunting, and benefits, the selling of goat meat, so you have value. So, that will be your cost-benefit analysis. However, with the ability to value ecosystem services and to look at the economic value of environmental and social costs and benefits, such as more vegetation because the free roaming goats don't eat all the new growth, new plants, less erosion, gardening, being able to um, produce fruits and vegetables in your own garden without goats eating them, less accidents, have, being able to put an economic value on those kind of externalities um, gives you a much better uh, informed cost-benefit analysis, and we call it an extended cost-benefit analysis. In the case of Bonaire, we did that, and we developed three scenarios. So we developed a scenario on restoration, um, where we looked at a coral nursery and reforestation. We looked at the scenario where we implement the sewage system, and we looked at the scenario uh, pure conservation, where we did something about the goats and also tried to bring the lionfish under control. If you look at the first row, it says benefits. And you can see that the sewage system has the highest benefit, $147 million. However, if you look at the costs, you also see that the sewage system has the highest cost. So, to really understand what your best benefit cost ratio is, so what is the most efficient and effective way to put your money, is in this case in conservation, it has a ratio of 4.6. So, these scenarios include also the benefits that ecosystem service deliver. It's an extended cost benefit analysis where we see that the conservation scenario would be the most efficient allocation of your financial means. So that what happened as well on Bonaire. On Bonaire, there was made 7.5 million dollars available. Uh, no, sorry, on Bonaire was 5.2 million dollars available for nature conservation, where they put most of that money in um, free roaming uh, animals and getting the goats under control. So another impact was as well um, is that at that moment in time, the executive council um, didn't they just claim that every vote is a, every goat is a vote. So they didn't want to touch, they didn't want to get the free roaming animals, every roaming goats under control. The study demonstrated that the local community has a willingness to pay for goat management. So that meant that the executive council was confronted with the fact that not every goat is a vote anymore, but that their residents actually want to address that issue. So, what he wants to do, the Commissioner Bonaire, is he wants to satisfy his electorate, the Bonairean residents. We demonstrated with our study that the Bonaire residents do want to get the free roaming goats under control. And so, Bonaire right now is indeed investing in this conservation management. Another um, example of how we uh, used the results of the study is in spatial planning. In this case, I'm going to present you example of SEBA, uh, where we um, allocated the value spatially. So, for example, here you see that the tourism value um, is allocated spatially on the island. Another one is local cultural and recreational value. As Nigella always also demonstrated, you have to look at more than only one service. So, we allocated the value of services spatially here for different services. Uh, here you see carbon sequestration. And all those layers in total ended up in a total economic value map for SEBA. That's what you see here. And what, how we used this map was as following. We looked at the boundaries um, of protected areas. So in this case, the blue line 
is the national park, the terrestrial national park. And the red line, above the red line, you couldn't build anymore. Um, so it's also a protected zone. And what you see in this case is that there is, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to, um, the orange and the red areas are, are having the highest value. So in this case, in the middle, you see the red area. That is a protected area. That's a forest, um, an elfin forest. But also the dark orange area are high value areas. And as you can see, a part of that area isn't protected right now. So the commissioner of SEBA decided, based on this insight that has been created, that um, he wants to protect those high nature values. And he is now looking into the opportunities to extend the boundaries of the terrestrial park um, and including that orange area that isn't protected yet. And the final application uh, for this study has been on sustainable financing. So um, the end result of the um, study in economic terms is that the total economic value of Bonaire was $105 million. And as you can see, it is a build up um, from different services uh, the, and value of services. And for example, the WWF, the Netherlands, used information about the non-use value, and that is the dark blue part, um, the biggest uh, part of the total economic value. And non-use value is the value that the residents in the Netherlands mainland have um, to protect nature in the Caribbean Netherlands without ever visiting that area or probably not going to visit that area. And this amount of money and this willingness of the people in the Netherlands to pay for uh, that nature over there, that convinced the management team of the WWF to allocate a three-year budget for the Caribbean Netherlands on nature conservation. Another impact was that there was a 7.5 million euros made available for nature conservation in the Caribbean Netherlands by the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs. And, as, and at the moment that they allocated 7.5 million for nature conservation, there was a huge debate if the 7.5 million shouldn't be allocated to poverty alleviation. Um, and then that money would go directly to the local government so that the local government could spend that uh, one, one time on poverty alleviation. Um, this study demonstrated that if you put the 7.5 million euros in nature conservation, you, you put that money to provide services for tourism, for fisheries and subsistence, and for agriculture. Those services and those industries then in their turn provide employment, income, food, health, and those attributes they do structurally alleviate poverty. So the study demonstrated that the 7.5 million to invest that in edge conservation will structurally um, help and address the poverty uh, on the island. So I just uh, presented uh, several impacts that the study um, has had. And um, I want to also address the success factors, but they are basically the same as uh, been discussed earlier on. Um, that is to really be very specific on the issues you want to address, use the ecosystem service approach, identify local interest, and just engage stakeholders from the beginning. Um, and also, if you collect primary data, make sure that the data that you collect really address the local issues. Um, the reports and results should support decision-making issues that are present, that are um, very um, uh, in the minds of decision-makers. And make sure that you have a good team, not only from people from outside, but also local people that are part of the team. And make sure that there's a lot of communication. Repeat the message over and over again. Thank you. Um, Christian? Many thanks. Many thanks, Esther. Um, 
this is a, this is a really an example I love because it shows how how uh, important the, the strong communication of ecosystem services to to the right people um, is, and and I like your way of putting it when you say what makes the clock tick in order to be to be sure that you have the message for them or the numbers for them or the information for them that these decision makers use. We have a number of questions from um, uh, from the audience already, but I'll I'll take them at the end of the. Uh, uh, of the session or after Samir's um, presentation. Um, I have a photo of Samir as well, but I think we'll just stick with this um, PowerPoint for now. Uh, Samir, as you can see in the slide here, he works with the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority Institute, and he's been uh, instrumental in putting together the recently adopted Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan, um, which is really a landmark for uh, integrating natural capital into um, management approaches. So, um, Samir, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to say thank you to the Blue Solutions and Panorama teams uh, for allowing me to give this presentation, and I hope all of you listening would learn a, a valuable lesson from our experiences here in Belize. So, as Christian said, my name is Samir Asado. I'm the Coastal Planner here at the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute in Belize, and I've been working on this integrated coastal zone management plan pretty much for the past six years. It's all I've been dedicated to working on. And so um, it's, an, it's a very interesting story and it's also a very interesting example of how we can, we can incorporate these uh, evaluations into, um, into informed integrated management. So um, with that, I'll begin. First of all, um, just to give a little context as to our um, our project here in Belize, um, we the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute is a quasi-government body. It's a statutory body, and we were mandated to create the Belize Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. The purpose of this plan really is to act as the planning framework for national action to facilitate improved management of coastal and marine ecosystems to maintain their integrity and ensure delivery of ecosystem service benefits. So uh, we were very keen on ensuring that ecosystem service benefits exist in perpetuity for all the benefit of all Belizeans and the international community. And so uh, this really came out uh, a long time ago when uh, we first started to in interact with stakeholders, you know, the very first question was, you know, what is your vision for the coast? Where do you see the coast uh, in the future? What would you like it to be? And a summary of the statements that we received from the stakeholders was that they wanted to see a sustainable future where healthy ecosystems support and are supported by thriving local communities and a vibrant economy. The three major ideas to, that we took from this was uh, healthy ecosystems, thriving local economy, uh, thriving local communities, and vibrant economy. There was a study done in 2009 by WRI, the World Resources Institute, that shows that this actually can be done. Um, they did a evaluation of the economic contributions of Belize's coral reefs and mangroves to the economy, and from that study, we see a, signi a significant amount of uh, contributions to the country's GDP by just having these ecosystems in place. And so when we speak on services, um, these are the activities that uh, come to mind and in Belize this is what the situation actually is. There are many different uh, activities, many different sectors that are driven by coastal resources in Belize. You have fishing, marine transportation, development, agriculture, and so on and so forth. And so the idea is that um, if you look at, the, at, the, at this illustration, you see that all of these activities, although separate, occur within the same space. And so it, give rises, it gives rise to a bunch of issues that, um, you, that we encountered as a country. Uh, this included uh, multiple competing uses within the coastal zone. So there are a lot of overlapping activities that took place. So uh, you could have fishing and diving in the same place, and it could be obstruct uh, diving could be obstructed by marine transportation and so on and so forth. So 
uh, we had a lot of user conflicts uh, that, that presented itself. Secondly, um, Belize is not necessarily or wasn't necessarily uh, data rich or uh, we didn't really advocate for data collection a lot in the past. And so um, there was a severe lack of information as it pertains to how coastal resources are being used and also the, uh, the tools that were necessary for the creation of the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan were lacking. Next again, um, as is the case in many countries, uh, there's a relatively low amount of funds available for doing this sort of activity for integrated coastal zone management and, and to get all of this you know, in line. So in coming up with an approach, we had to sort of keep those issues in mind and create an approach that would allow us to create something meaningful using relatively limited resources. And so these are the four main approaches that we took in creating our integrated coastal zone management plan. The first step was a literature review and research of documents that already existed. Uh, from these documents, oh sorry, these documents included anything from uh, management plans to uh, policies, uh, laws, uh, everything that we could get our hands on that related to the coastal, coastal resource use, we took and extracted information. And this type of information was both spatial and um, non-spatial information. Next, we had an extensive stakeholder engagement process. The idea behind the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan was never to create something and uh, just ram it down the throats of the, the, the stakeholders. The idea instead was to build from the bottom up to have the stakeholders themselves uh, create this plan. And so what we did we took the entire coastal areas of Belize and we divided it into nine planning regions from north to south. And within those planning regions, we assembled what we called coastal advisory committees. These committees were made up of uh, stakeholders from um, a multi-sectoral array, ranging from NGOs, government agencies, to fishermen, to uh, farmers, educational institution, and what have you. And so we tried to have representation from all the main stakeholders so as to get a, a, a diverse group that could actually speak on the issues that are occurring within each of their planning regions. And so uh, these coastal advisory committees actually led the way and led the planning efforts from within their region. And from these regional CACs, as we call them, we expanded upward and created and addressed national issues. And so our list of national issues actually came from these smaller CAC groups. In addition to just this, these offshore areas, um, I, I need to add, we also extended sort of our definition of what the coastal zone is, in, uh, and specifically for planning reasons. And so because in Belize, the coastal zone is defined as the area from the mean high water mark to the extent of the territorial seas. However, the activities of land, as we all know, affects, has direct bearing on what occurs in the coastal zone. And so in our planning, we added this three kilometer zone of influence, which extends inward and extended our planning powers to these areas along the coast. And so this really helped us in anticipating uh, f future effects to the coastal zone. With that stakeholder engagement process, or I should say during that stakeholder engagement process, process we were able to create uh, spatial maps of coastal resource use. And so during those meetings, what we did, we asked stakeholders who are, lo who are the local experts, because uh, one thing I must add is that uh, to first begin this process, uh, what we had to do is sort of humble ourselves and, to, and admit to ourselves that we were not the experts in, ter uh, in terms of coastal resource use in these areas. We, were, we are centralized here in Belize City, and so we have no idea what is happening in, in the real world with regard to coastal resource use. And so 
we had to admit that at the very beginning and realize that these people, the actual users, are the experts for these areas. And so uh, with that in mind, we went to these uh, different regions and we asked the stakeholders to actually map out where certain activities take place. The, we, we did this through uh, various means. It, it ranged from actually printing out huge versions of maps and having them physically draw on maps uh, so as to um, indicate where these areas are. We worked with uh, a group from the States. I will, men I will speak a little bit more on them uh, in a minute, but they gave us a tool that Samir? Have we lost you? Um, have I think we we've lost Samir. Lost? Yes, I think we've lost Samir. Hello? Yep. Oh, there you are. Uh, Samir, sorry. sorry. Okay. We lost oh. you a, a few minutes ago, so you may have kept speaking after we couldn't hear your sound. Oh, do you remember what the, the last thing is? The last thing I heard was you uh, speaking of US based organization who's given you a tool. Oh, okay, that. okay. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, all right. Yeah, so we, we made use of a tool that, um, that allowed us to email maps or Google Maps to uh, stakeholders that were more tech savvy to actually draw their own shape files and then send it into us. So data collection from these um, different stakeholder groups uh, uh, varied. But uh, um, all of that was to say that uh, we were able, with their help, to create maps of coastal resource use. And the example on the screen is for marine recreation. However, we also did it for dredging, for marine transportation, for aquaculture, agriculture, development, uh, fishing, and oil exploration. And besides the current situation, which would be as it stands now, we also asked them to create different scenarios of what they believe um, resource use would look like under other uh, situations and so we created a conservation scenario which pretty much uh, prioritizes conservation needs over development needs. We did the complete opposite which was uh, a development scenario which, uh, which addressed solely development needs and then we also created an informed management scenario which blends the two ideals together. It has, it addresses that immediate development need with conservation ideals in mind. And so really going, the, the, the scenario that we endorsed as Coastal Zone was this informed management, which is a blend of the two ideals. So after creating these, um, these different scenarios, we needed to assess, you know, how these diff, how would the delivery of services change under these different scenarios? And so for that, we made use of a tool uh, um, called the Marine Invest tool, with Marine Invest standing for Marine Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. And so what this tool does is that it uses spatial information and, um, and takes these scenarios and actually puts a loss or a value to the loss of ecosystem services that we receive from sensitive habitats and in this case we're speaking about seagrass beds, coral reefs and mangroves and so this is an example of the type of information that it produces. It produces um, in this case it values it in terms of money and in our specific uh, example this was very very important for the actual um, passage, so to speak, or adoption of this plan because money is a universal language. It allowed us to speak directly to stakeholders and to take that same information and 
go to government agencies and to politicians and also speak to them because they understood this universal language of money. And so, um, and in that way, we were able to take all of the subjective information that we received during that process from these uh, stakeholder groups and translate it into a way, give it, give it some teeth, give it some, um, uh, break it down into this universal language which allowed us to speak to everyone and in the end we were able to get this, this plan adopted. And so essentially that was our overall approach in terms of um, how we went about creating our integrated coastal zone management plan. So speaking on this key, on this partnership um, uh, with the, for the use of this mo uh, modeling tool, uh, as I mentioned, we formed a partnership with the Natural Capital Project and the WWF for the use of Marine Invest. Now, in this partnership in creating this plan, the Coastal Zone uh, Management Authority and Institute, we acted as the, the policy lead and um, pretty much for data collection. Uh, the Natural Capital Project, again, lent us the use of this model, this um, GIS modeling um, model, and helped in uh, analyzing the, the, the model and also for training and mentoring the uh, staff here at Coastal Zone. And then finally, the WWF was the project facilitator and they sort of played that capacity building role and also helped us to um, bridge the gap between science and policy because there was some there was some translation that needed to be uh, needed to happen. So using this ecosystem service modeling, uh, just to reiterate, we were able to blend that stakeholder engagement with science tools to map, measure, and value ecosystem services. This played a very big role in the success of this plan, and the services that we targeted because the the ecosystem. So uh, the, the model allows you to examine certain ecosystem services that are provided by these uh, sensitive habitats. The ones that we focused on were fisheries, coastal protection, and tourism, which four Belize are our, um, our biggest um, income earners in terms of tourism and fisheries, and really coastal protection is universally uh, an important thing. Uh, Next, uh, we, we were able to design a spatially explicit zoning plan that would meet the objectives of many people, uh, uh, of many stakeholder groups, while at the same time uh, minimizing the negative effects to sensitive habitats that provide the service, because that was always the, the intent of this plan, to promote use, but to promote sustainable use. Then finally, it allowed us to make recommendations to policy and decision makers. So the, the, the end result was a plan that was twofold. First of all, this volume one is addresses more national issues. It um, it presents all uh, it presents an implementation and action plan which highlights activities that are needed, or in our case, management interventions that are needed to address. Um, to address the, the, the problems identified within the stakeholder groups. And then the volume two is actually for each of those nine regions we present we created a coastal zone management guideline which identifies the issues that are within the area. It um, identifies action uh, actions for uh, rectifying those issues. It presents the relevant legislation and the lead agencies responsible for addressing these issues. And besides that, it also presents a spatial plan and a zoning scheme specific to that area. So just to speak on the process, uh, what we've been through, and this sort of summarizes our entire um, process for the creation of the plan. The plan has been prepared. It's been modified because it went through several uh, iterations between us and stakeholder groups within regions and us and government stakeholders and so it's been modified and as of August 2016 it received its final step towards uh, approval. So currently we are in the effectuation and simultaneous implementation and monitoring phases and 
with that, we also have received funding for the first five years of implementation and monitoring. Now, the plan built into our act is that the plan is to be revised every four years, and after the four-year period, a new version of the plan is due. And so this makes the implementation and monitoring uh, phase of this plan very important because as we are uh, working with agencies to get this plan implemented, we are also uh, monitoring the success and identifying where shortcomings are and then we, out, we can begin to identify how to rectify these for, before or in anticipation of this, this revision process, this revision period. So just to summarize, uh, facts, first of all, the plan is not a blueprint for conservation, but rather for sustainability. And it does not restrict activities, but rather reduces user conflict because as we, and, and these, these user conflicts, again, have to do with the, with, the, with the scenarios, with the spatial plans, with the zoning schemes that we created that were based on the ecosystem service valuations that we uh, obtain from the use of the uh, marine invest model. Uh, third, it was not created by us, rather it was prepared by these uh, stakeholder communities. So it was from, it was created by these stakeholder groups within all of those regions. And that's very important because it gives a sense of ownership to this process and it also helps with the so socialization of the plan once it was completed. The informed management zoning scheme is our best way forward in terms of uh, coastal resource use. Uh, in terms of benefits, uh, we triple the area for coastal resource use from the, the current scenario. Uh, we boost revenue from key sectors. We increase the overall functional area of coastal coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass beds, and double the value of those ecosystems for protecting the coast. And the, the plan is forward thinking, which is why you see by 25, so by 2025. So besides, um, when creating the scenarios, uh, we ask stakeholders to think, uh, think about, you know, 15 years, at the time it was 15 years in the future, you know, or, or 10 years, I can't remember what it was at the time, but uh, we asked them to think forward. And so this was sort of that time frame that we provided. Uh, it ensures sustainability of coastal resources important for the lab, for livelihoods of these communities. It will improve the overall quality of life for coastal communities. And finally, reduce the area of habitats at risk by, um, I think a word is missing, but it will reduce those um, areas at uh, high risk. Finally, uh, reflections and challenges. Um, of course, as I mentioned, data availability was a problem. Um, however, this, this uh, Marine Invest tool, it doesn't require a ton of data. And so, and it's easily validated by uh, government agencies or those agencies that actually regulate these sectors. And so, whereas you, we didn't have a ton of data to work with, with the information that was available, we were able to produce something that was actually acceptable by, was actually accepted by government agencies that um, that actually um, uh, manage uh, specific aspects of coastal resource use as well as um, accepted by stakeholders themselves. Uh, we created tools to create a strong science-based plan and we found a way to translate complex information for different audiences. Um, Success factors or lessons learned. Uh, the iterative stakeholder driven process is, was definitely uh, a big success. It allowed for um, stakeholder buy-in, for community buy-in, and the, it helped with socialization. And uh, it also pushed the buy-in from central government because you had the people supporting the plan. And finally, we were able to create an implementation and monitoring and evaluation plan which would ensure the success of this plan. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you guys again. Um, the original presentation was created by, largely in part by um, Mr. Gregory Verudes, who 
um, at the time of the Blue Solutions Conference, we, it was a dual presentation by him and myself, so just wanted to put his contact information on this also. So, thanks again. Hey, thanks, Samir. Um, Sorry, can I just, um, my audio was gone for a minute. Can somebody just reconfirm that I... Yes, yeah, we can hear you, Christian. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, repeat, there's a, there's a questions panel that you can type into on pretty much on the middle of your uh, GoToWebinar control panel where you can type in questions uh, to anyone and on, on pretty much on anything. Um, we have uh, one question here um, from, from Michael Tanner, or I don't know where you're from, Michael, um, uh, to Esther. Um, so Michael's question is geared towards methods and concepts in the environmental, uh, sorry, in the economical um, valuation. So Michael is asking, given that data is sometimes lacking to use revealed preferences methods, let's get it pretty specific, would you trust stated preference methodologies so as to capture the tourism value provided by mangroves? So um, Esther, do you want to um, answer that? the use of revealed preference versus stated preference <laughs> and how that's... <laughs> <laughs> Especially the trusted one, is, uh, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, well, the, the, the answer is not uh, very straightforward. The, the, the problem is in the fact uh, trust that you're asking uh, me about. Um, yes, we do use uh, a lot of stated preference um, but you have to be very clear on what you have been doing, which methods you have used, and um, when presenting also the results. So um, we do use it, and we do use it in scenarios to make clear and to give insight in what the outcome would be of the different scenarios. But also we do sensitivity analysis to make sure and also to present what would be the case if we didn't use that kind of data. Um, so you, we, do, we use it a lot um, also because it gives a, a pretty good idea about what people, how people feel. But you have to be really careful about presenting it as absolute numbers and you also have to be very um, um, precise in you know in the sensitivity of those numbers. Um, I hope that gives a, a bit of a uh, answer about it. Um, and um, yeah, I think that otherwise we go too much in detail. I think. Thanks. Um, uh, I have another um, technical, or maybe as a follow-up question from me on this one for Samir. Um, you mentioned uh, the invest model and how that's producing these very sort of hexagon, um, very compelling maps. Um, did you, how did you sort of manage um, people's trust in that? Because these things, these maps can be quite convincing in many ways, um, particularly to policymakers who want to, you know, who want to see decisions or who want to see answers. Yeah, um, well, it varied. Um... For government stakeholders, for those agencies that actually manage the, um, the different uh, coastal resource use, for example, maybe the fisheries department, let's just say. Um, what we did was, uh, as we went through, we worked, first of all, we had to obtain the data from them. So the, the lobster data or whatever that we, we was necessary, we obtained from them. And so what we did, we... The, to use Marine Invest, you sort of have to fill out uh, uh, just a, a sort of a ranking of uh, various different criteria, and so we did it arbitrarily at first, and then this, uh, afterwards we did it with um, these agencies. We ran through it with the data, and then we also uh, produced some results, and so we kept tweaking it and tweaking it until the results from Marine Invest matched what their projections were in-house about uh, the state of um, the, 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 the fisheries industry, which is, say, so to speak, uh, moving forward. And so that sort of produced that, that, that buy-in from these government agencies. As it relates to um, 
the, the communities themselves, uh, they first of all were um, were sort of swayed um, by the fact that these government agencies also participated in the, the validation of the of the model outputs. But once they uh, saw the numbers that were were being produced from the model and they re uh, related to sort of what the situation is, uh, they, the confidence in what the, the, the model outputs were showing actually grew. So it, it, it was, depending on the audience, it, it, it happened in, in different ways. Thanks, Samir. I have, I have a, a number of follow-up questions uh, for you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give three of them to you. Uh, the first one is, um, how do you, sorry, the first one would be, um, did you add a temporal layer or a temporal dimension to your ecosystem service assessments? So um, thinking that you could possibly have multiple uh, uses in the same zone, although they are conflicting if they happened at the same time. So that's one question. Um, and then um, Melina Soto is asking, how did you manage to double the value of mangroves and seagrass for coastal protection with stakeholders? And then secondly, also from her, who or which institution is financing these first years of implementation? All right. Okay. Um, to add to answer your question, yeah, as it relates to user conflicts, it, there were some areas where uh, there are compatible uses, and so within the um, within the the, the, the the coastal zone management guidelines for for each region, we do have uh, zoning maps that have overlapping usages, and those usages were identified by stakeholders as. Um, those that could actually coexist. And for the ones that are conflicted, then among the coastal advisory committees, they actually work to sort of curtail these areas to make sure that the areas of uh, conflicting activities did not overlap. And so um, that was, um, and then uh, in addition, we also have uh, included in the guidelines a framework for the implementation of the zoning schemes, which identifies which activities are compatible, which ones aren't, and the reasons why they aren't, and under which legislation, under which act, and they aren't compatible, and finally, which uh, agencies are responsible for um, for addressing issues with relation to over over with relation to conflicts. So um, that I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, the question was on whether you had a temporal dimension in it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I, I, sorry. Um, yes, I believe so, but I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure on it, but I can answer you you later on. I'd have to. I don't want to say yes, and I'm not sure. I'd have to um, check with the data manager. But can I answer you um, at another time? Or yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I just anyway. Um, and then the other question was how we doubled the the value of the the mangroves. Yes, how the stakeholders um, finally saw an increased value for both mangroves and seagrass. Okay, so for this one, um, this is we receive these um, values through again through through the modeling, and so what we did um, was we asked the the stakeholders to 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 to, to create the the scenarios as I mentioned, and so from the scenario. It, for each activity, it has an underlying risk that it presents to uh, mangroves, to seagrass beds. And so in the creation of those zoning schemes, we uh, ran the models, we brought the results back to the, um, to the, to the uh, stakeholder groups. They looked at it, they decided whether or not this was an acceptable output, and uh, in many cases it wasn't. And so 
they curtailed their activities more, they added more conservation areas, they um, made sure that uh, activities that were detrimental or posed a high risk to mangroves were not uh, in close proximity to important mangrove areas and so we sort of toyed with the um, with the develop with the scenario development until we reached to a point that you saw an effective um, doubling of of this uh, valuation in terms of uh, mangrove and seagrass beds. So this all had to do with uh, the the scenario development with the uh, with the zoning schemes and of course with the um, with the model outputs. Um, in terms of the the financing for the five years, we um, the government of Belize uh, signed on to a project that's being implemented by the World Bank. It's called the Marine Conservation and Climate Climate Adaptation Project, and under that project, uh, we received funding to to implement and monitor the implementation of the plan for the first five years. Thanks, Samir. Um, I'd have a final I'd have a final question um, to to Nicola. You um, you mentioned that in one of your challenges at the very beginning of your presentation how um, sometimes ecosystem services can be a very academic term that puts people off, puts stakeholders off. Um, I wondered um, if you've come across other sort of descriptions of ecosystem services in communities, how where people are using ecosystem services but just don't call it that. Or other perceptions of it. Or, um, Nicola, are you still there? Um, Nicola, you might you may be self muted. Or... She doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, I have uh, one final question here. If uh, nobody else has one, and it, oh, Nicola, you are there. Then you're muted. Um, no, you can't unmute. Sarah, can you unmute her? No, it, it, the system is saying she's self-muted. I can't undo okay. it. All right. Um, we have one question here uh, from the audience, from um, John Burgess, who's asking, can we have the presentations? And, and I think, yes. Uh, Sarah was saying that um, sh we have your emails when, from when you registered. Um, so I'd obviously have to ask the presenters if they want to share their, um, their presentations. But in general, we can do this. Um, so we'll share those that we... Um, then we're allowed to. Um, a question from Juan uh, to Samir. Is there any territorial um, planning program in Belize? And how does, Be does the Belize Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan integrate in on developing zone? Um, Juan, is your question on is if there's a terrestrial planning program that would um, sort of link up to this? Was, uh, was a question about what it was about terrestrial? I'm unsure. Uh, Juan says territorial. Yes, uh, is if there's a terrestrial planning program because very early on in your slides you said, um, of course we have impacts from the terrestrial environment on the on the coastal. And if there's a sort of complementary process. Thank you, Juan. Okay. Uh, in Belize, yes, there is. Uh, we have a, a separate uh, land, use author land use authority that does terrestrial um, planning. Uh, in our case, though, um, uh, when we planned for the coastal areas, we actually um, did it with the help of the communities that live in these areas themselves. And so, um, as a part of our process, when I mentioned that we included a part of the coast, it means that we included those communities that live along the coast. And then we examined um, their, um, their activities and how they can curtail their activities in order to reduce effects on the coastal zone. In, the, in monitoring the implementation and success of the plan, one of the things that we're also doing is that we're um, sort of st uh, taking this ridge to reef approach and we're monitoring uh, rivers um, and 
the effects of uh, activities upstream on the coastal zone. So we want to further extend our planning powers uh, in whenever the revision is due to you know these watershed areas because that's sort of our main source of um, if there is pollution or contamination or changes those would be the sources of it and um, we did um, we did sort of liaise with land use uh, the land use uh, authority however but uh, for the most part we did uh, our own planning as uh, in in relation to the terrestrial portion of the coastal zone. Thanks, Samir. Um, Juan says that unfortunately he couldn't hear you, um, but um, uh, if that's okay with you, uh, Samir, then I would uh, share both your presentation as a PDF or whatever, as well as your email. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, another question to Samir, you're very popular here. Um, can you elaborate a little more on the implementation process over the next four years? Which are the stakeholders who are involved? Okay, so uh, within the national plan, we created an uh, implementation and action plan. And this implementation plan is sort of a list of all the action items that were identified from the regional coastal advisory committees as well as those that we identified in looking at national issues and so what we did we sort of broke them into different thematic areas so for example uh, mangrove protection and um, fisheries management and stuff like that these different thematic groups and so uh, we listed all the action items we listed who which government agencies are responsible for implementing these action items, under which act are they supposed to be that authority for um, doing these action items. We also went a step further and listed um, those agencies that have a vested interest, so partner agencies that could help in, in um, accomplishing the action items we identified. Um, next, we identified a time frame which is, which is not to say that we uh, we wanted these action items to be time bound, so to speak, but we just wanted to sort of use it as a as an indication of priority. And then we also um, went a step further and tried to give a, a, a an approximate value of or approximate budget of what it would cost more or less to to, to get this done, and so. The imp in, in the implementation phase now, what we're doing is that we're actually working with these government agencies and with the uh, stakeholder groups, the communities, to actually get the ac action items done, to get them accomplished. And why I say we're working with communities as well is that we're, we're making the communities aware of what the actions are and for them to hold these agencies accountable for uh, getting these action items completed and so at the end of the day at the end of the four years our, um, what we will do we will have to go through this implementation plan and see which items were accomplished which ones weren't and if they weren't why and then we can then revise and then continue to work to get them done thanks Amir we have a final question um, to the Caribbean presenters uh, by Tali uh, asking if any of you had explicitly quantified the ecosystem service value of active coral restoration, especially the value for fisheries and coastal protection. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, if you've quantified ecosystem service value of active coral restoration, of coral you or uh, or Esther? Oh, of restoration? No, no, I haven't. No. Although we do have, um, I mean, if 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 the if the person is uh, interested in um, in restor coral restoration work, we do have uh, under the same project a group that's doing coral restoration, and so I'm. Um, you could, they could maybe, you could give them my email address and I could try to put them in touch with, yeah. with, with those people. 
I don't know if uh, if Esther is um, is yeah. is on or her audio is. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I am here. Um, yes, Amy, uh, one of the things that I showed during the presentation was um, uh, a comparison between three different scenarios, which was uh, restoration, switch system implementation, and conservation. In the scenario of restoration, we looked at coral reef um, uh, restoration, so on a coral nursery. Um, I must say it has been um, not very uh, detailed uh, study, so um, uh, I'm not sure, um, but I have to look again at the scenario to see we exactly have modeled. Uh, I think we used Stella for a model. Um, but uh, what it turned out to be that it, it does add value, but if you, do, if you don't address the uh, threats to the systems, just the nutrient loads and other threats, then you can do coral reef restoration, but it's not as effective as addressing the threats first and then rebuild. Why then? Thanks, Esther. That makes. That makes much sense. Um, we have uh, one more question from Juan, but cognizant of time, Juan, I suggest um, you go to the uh, to the a Panorama platform where you find a lot of background information on the Bonaire uh, case study that that Esther presented, and uh, we'll find answers to your questions as well. I'm. Um, I would like to thank everybody. Thank everybody who's uh, who's participated uh, as a, the audience. Uh, thanks everybody who stayed for the extra hour in the beginning. Uh, particularly thanks to the um, presenters, of course, for their insights and practical experience and so forth. I think it was really really interesting. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, Here's, here's a list of the speakers again, and we'll send out the uh, presentations as has been requested. And here's a link again to the uh, website. Links to the news solutions as well as Panorama. Find and find more information on the news as well. If there's anything else you'd like to, to, to talk about related to the refuse projects, please please hesitate to contact me. Me, my man, my man. Ed, 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 also, just to note that I had a slide. Um, we have, uh, through the Green Solutions Initiative, a range of training workshops. One is on integrating ecosystem services into marine and coastal development planning. And actually, I think that's Esther on the table there in the second picture from the left that's her climbing on the table uh, in one of those training workshops. They're good <laughs> fun. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, have a great day. Have a great evening, wherever you are. And um, hope to see you for the next Panorama webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>